uh, respond to something that Lisa said earlier in the week. And um, it was about fathers. And she put a post out there uh, speaking about uh, the cry uh, that's out in the body of Christ for fathers. And um, I responded to that uh, in this way. Uh, I made a statement uh, back to her post that said, they, those who are crying out for fathers, must connect with the sound of the father's voice and then be willing to submit to the father's grace and guidance. Connect to the sound of the father's voice and then be willing to submit to the father's grace and guidance. And so um, <clears throat> a few minutes later, she responded back. Uh, to that, or maybe an hour or so later, actually, and said, you know, I've really been thinking about that comment, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you mean by the sound. And um, and I said, okay, I'll get back to you later in the week. And, uh, and so this is my later in the week. This is uh, my response to Lisa Atkinson. And prayerfully, I'm sure uh, a lot of folk are doing different things on this Saturday morning, but Hopefully, Lisa can pick up on this later and, um, and get an answer to, uh, at least some answers to some of the questions that she's had. But it's not only Lisa. Uh, this is something that uh, I continually see over and over and time and time again. And I just thought I'd uh, make a contribution to this whole conversation, okay? Uh, again, I don't want to be with you an extended amount of time. Uh, I do want to just briefly handle the subject uh, from my vantage point and my perspective as a father in the faith and one who has fathered many. And, um, and I'd like to say that I have a father's heart. Uh, that's just part of my DNA. That's part of who I am and part of what God's called me to be. And so um, I don't want to get into any great extensive conversation about the validity of spiritual fathers. Um, for me, it's something that's a given. It's, it's not something that's debatable. But I understand that different people have different perspectives on that. And God bless you. You have a right to believe in spiritual fathers or not to believe in spiritual fathers or to believe that you need a spiritual father or that you don't need one. That's okay. Um, but because I believe in spiritual fathers, I've submitted to spiritual fathers in my lifetime, and I am a spiritual father, and uh, therefore uh, it's not a debate for me, it's not an argument, it's something that I've already embraced. I embraced it uh, spiritually, I've embraced it scripturally, and I've embraced it practically. Uh, these are things you have to work out for yourself. And um, but so I'm speaking uh, today to individuals who are not necessarily wrestling with that issue, but are perhaps maybe struggling with trying to find a spiritual father uh, and trying to understand how they find a spiritual father. So um, here we go. I'm going to only be um, in. Uh, one section of the Bible uh, today, I might mention a few things differently in other places, but I only want to take you to one section of the Bible because that one section of the Bible will, will uh, help me to answer the question that Lisa originally had, which is, uh, there are people out here crying for fathers, and that's who I want to speak to, and they don't know how to connect with those. And I think Eric Rose out in California mentioned the same thing. Again, God bless you, and uh, I want to talk about, uh, briefly here, the sound of a father's voice, the sound of the father's voice, and God bless you for those others of you that have come on, bless you, Don Charles Thomas and uh, Brianna Cunningham and uh, Jaron Darden, uh, Luke Henley, bless you, Anthony Earl, bless you, sir, uh, so glad to have all of you on here, and uh, I, again, just want to be on here for 20, 30 minutes and talk about this subject, the sound of a father's voice. How do you know how to connect to your spiritual father or find a spiritual father 
or connect to a spiritual father's voice. And I believe that, uh, again, the, one of the great parts of connecting to a spiritual voice, a father is via that father's voice. And uh, I, I want to read from John chapter 10. And um, John chapter 10 uh, will serve as kind of as a backdrop and a foundation for what I want to say about this subject. Uh, verse 1 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up another way, or some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, on the outset, I want to say that this is a parable, okay? It's a parable, and Jesus says this is a parable later on. Uh, probably won't get to that verse, but Jesus says this is a parable. That means that he is speaking something in a figurative sense in order to communicate a vital spiritual message or lesson to those who have ears to hear. And uh, Jesus said in another place that uh, individuals who understand parables are those who have a heart and a desire to hear what's being spoken. And the Holy Spirit, when you have a heart and a desire to hear, the Holy Spirit will open up your ear gates. He'll open up your spirit. The Holy Spirit will cause um, that revelation, that impartation, to really come into alignment with your spirit. And so this is a parable. So again, uh, for individuals that don't believe in spiritual fathers and fight this whole issue of spiritual fathers, this might not be a message for you, but maybe it is. Maybe if you just listen and open your heart, uh, this parable will speak to you, okay? Uh, so, um, Jesus said, uh, he that enters in by the door, or not by the door, is a thief and a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, uh, on a big picture, on a big scale, he's talking about himself, Christ. He's talking about himself. I want to extract the principles from this particular section of Scripture and apply it to the whole arena of spiritual fathers. And a spiritual father really is just an earthly shepherd. That's all. Uh, a spiritual father is a pastor. Some, many times a, a, an apostle is a pastor of pastors or other leaders, other fivefold leaders or others. Uh, not limited to that. Uh, many apostles are uh, pastors or, or fathers to those that have no fivefold calling, but they are part of his DNA. And, and so, but a father is a type of a shepherd. And, um, but a father is, is distinct in his calling and his DNA. Everybody who's a shepherd even is not a father. And so we have to really sort these things out so that we understand how to find a father and how to connect with a father. And so uh, I, I'm sure I won't exhaust the topic today. Uh, matter of fact, I know I won't exhaust it. But I will share a few principles that will help you in identifying uh, how you can connect with a spiritual father and how to recognize a spiritual father when you see one and recognize the spiritual father that you should be connected to, okay? So, verse 2, uh, he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Let me go to my, uh, I typed this out so that I wouldn't have to look down at my Bible. I can just look, hopefully, straightforward. To him the porter openeth. To him the porter openeth. And I just want to, again, use this as pattern and type to share some spiritual principle, okay? So, he that enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And there's a door of our heart. All of us have a door to our heart. And we don't want a thief to come in to that door. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is there to be a guide, to teach us, right? And 
to be a vehicle of discernment and a place where we can make decisions that are in alignment with the trial nature of God. And so the Holy Spirit functions as a porter. We'll see this in just a, sense, a moment. The Holy Spirit in you functions as a porter in your life. A porter, Old Testament porter, was one who guarded the door, guarded the gate, guarded the treasure. And the Holy Spirit is a porter in, your, in all of our lives, in our personal lives individually. The Holy Spirit functions as a porter. And the Holy Spirit in you should be a porter in your life to help you discern whether there's a thief or a robber that's trying to come in your door or get access to your life or whether it's actually somebody who has a shepherding spirit who is a father for you. And, and so uh, that's the first principle. That's something that, you know, we, we should all be aware of that. The Holy Spirit functions in that way. And so, so you have to become aware of how the Holy Spirit is operating in your life and you have to know the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay, bless you, Pastor Sebastian and Cedric and Jacob in California, I think. Amen. Um, Sean, uh, Comfort Duff, my young lion, Maxwell Ogaga out of Nigeria. God bless you. Hope you had a safe trip back home. Amen. He was just in the United States um, just uh, last week or so, and uh, his father and I, uh, have great covenant relationship, uh, Dr. Ogaga. Um, so Pastor Maxwell, by the way, is doing an awesome work in Nigeria. If you're in Nigeria, uh, you need to connect with him. I know Nigeria is a large country, but um, follow him on his Facebook page. He is a young emerging voice in Nigeria. Amen. Um, so the Bible says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. The porter, the Holy Spirit, will be function as a porter in your life to protect you. A porter protects the gate, protects the door, protects the treasure. And so the Holy Spirit functions as a porter in our lives, and it enables us to recognize things that are consistent with who we are, and we'll see that in just a, a moment, or those things that we should stay away from, that whole spirit of discernment arena, okay? So he that open enters uh, by the, the, the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him that him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And this is what I was saying to uh, my friend Lisa Atkinson um, when I said to her, they must connect with the sound of the Father's voice and then be willing to submit to the Father's grace and guidance. If you're looking for a spiritual father, you have to connect with the sound of the Father's voice. We all have a voice, and our voice, um, I, I just briefly looked this up in the Old Testament, Old Testament word, one of the definitions is the audible intelligent sounds of a human or a group of humans, or of God. The audible, intelligent sound. And if you are looking to connect with a father, you are looking for an audible, intelligent sound. You're looking for an audible, intelligent sound. It's audible and it's intelligent, not only to your natural mind, but to your spirit. It makes sense. If somebody's talking gibber jobbery, uh, foolishness, you don't want to connect to that. And then some people aren't really talking foolishness, but it just doesn't resonate with you. It's not something that fits into your DNA. You don't hear a, 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 a requisite sound, a sound that resonates with you and makes sense with you and fits when, within your framework. Uh, I'll, I'll unpack this in just a, a couple moments, but you have to hear a sound of a voice that you recognize. I was sharing with uh, uh, my barber a few days ago. 
Um, and we were actually got into this conversation uh, while he was cutting my hair. And uh, he said, uh, Apostle Warren, how do you, how do you recognize, um, and he said, not, he, he wasn't talking about himself, he said, how do you recognize a son, a spiritual son, and how, do, how does a spiritual son recognize you? And I said, well, one of the first principles is that a spiritual son hears my voice, and he recognizes in that voice something that sounds like him. Now look, I'm going to get back to that in just a second, but look at this. The sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. And I said to him, when you walk into your house, and you've got a son, and you say, Fred, Freddie, come here, Freddie. Your son recognizes your voice. You call to him, and he recognizes your voice. And what does your son do when he recognizes your voice? And he said, he comes. He, he pays attention and then he comes. And I said, exactly. That's the same principle with spiritual fathers and sons. When a son hears the voice of a father, he turns in recognition of that voice and then he moves toward that voice. If you're looking for a spiritual father, you have to find somebody who's speaking and in that speaking you hear a voice that recognizes that resonates with you you recognize that voice and even in his exposition of the word of the lord or whatever it is that he's offloading it's like he is calling or she is calling your name and I want to tell you, I, I don't know if you've experienced that. I've experienced it. I, I know exactly what it is. I know exactly how it feels. Hey, there you go. Hey, Lisa, bless you. Good to see you on here. Amen. Okay, you just saw it. I understand. Um, you can go back and pick it up from the beginning later on. But uh, glad to have you on here, Lisa and Camila and my friend Tracy. Amen. Glad to have you all on here, T. Faulkner. Um, so, uh, David Peppers, bless you. I think I saw your wife out there also. God bless you guys doing a great work in Columbus. Amen. So, um, he calleth his sheep by name. And I said to my barber, I said, look, when you walk in the house and you call Fred, Fred turns and he says, hey, daddy, he recognizes your voice. But if I walk in your house and I say, hey, Freddie, your son's going to look at me and go, well, huh, who are you? I don't know you. Right? Why? Because he doesn't recognize my voice. Now, let me say this. All of us, especially those of us who function in a fivefold capacity, and most particularly what I'm talking about this morning, those who our spiritual fathers, we have a distinctive sound to our voice. I'm not talking about these vocal cords. I'm talking about our spiritual voice. There's something that resonates, that, that vibrates, that comes out of me. Uh, there's a syncopation to my voice. There's a cadence to my voice. There's something in my spiritual voice that is going to connect and is going to resonate with anybody that's supposed to be connected to me, okay? Uh, so uh, you will, it will again almost be as if you are calling my name. And I'm telling you, I've, I've listened to people, you know, back in the day and my early years of ministry and I'd hear somebody minister, I go, wow, he's not only talking to me, he's speaking for me. It's as if I am speaking because we are that much in sync spiritually, okay? Now, let me just uh, throw a little caveat in here uh, while I'm saying that because everybody who sounds like you is not necessarily your father, okay? Very important. Everybody who sounds like you or whose voice is consistent with your voice is not necessarily your father. Sometimes you hear a voice that sounds like your voice 
that you recognize a similar DNA, but that person may be a brother or a sister or an uncle or related to you, but not necessarily your father. Okay? So you, we have to understand these matters because if you don't, you get all confused. There are many people connecting with individuals that they're calling fathers and they're not their father. They're, it's their brother. A father, by sheer um, definition, has to be somebody who has the spiritual or natural age not to birth you, a mother births you, but a father deposits seeds that is like it, it, that seed actually germinates something in you and brings life to you. But a father, by very de definition, can't be somebody who's on the same quote unquote level with you. Okay? And I know it's dangerous territory. Because we're real super super sensitive about anybody being on a hierarchy than us, or whether they're on the same level or hierarchy, or so whatever. Okay, um, I, I I figured that out a long time ago when my father and I connected with one another, and uh, uh, I met my father at 14, and uh, we were separated from the time I was about two or three until I was 14, and um, I met him at 14 and. And some of you all know my story, and I, I didn't know whether to hit him or kiss him, but uh, we developed a good, strong, loving relationship by the time he passed. Many years later, we developed a very sound father-son relationship. But I want to tell you something. I never had any question about who was father and who was son. Okay? I didn't want to have a question about it. As a matter of fact, my dad knew very little about the Bible. I was a pastor. My dad knew hardly anything about the Bible. But I want to tell you, he's my father. Okay? And I love the fact that he was my daddy. I wanted him to be my father. I didn't want to be on equal terms with my daddy. Okay? If you are in relationship with somebody and you can feel like you're on an equal term with them, that's not your father. Okay? That's your brother. That's not your father. A father is not on equal terms with you. You have to be able to humble yourself and revere, reverence a father for who he is. If you think you're as good as or on the same level as your father, quote unquote, that's not your father. Not a practical sense. That's not a, that is not your father. That's your brother. And I want to tell you, we need to really get, the, get these matters straight and understand them properly because there are too many individuals that I see connecting the people who are brothers and calling them a father. And there are too many others who are saying, I don't, I don't want quote unquote this hierarchy. I just want an equal relationship. Let me just tell you, when I'm looking, when I need a father, I don't need an equal relationship. I need a father. Okay. I need a father. Bless you, Chuck. I need a father that can speak into my life. Come on, Spring. Bless you. Amen, Spring. Uh, I need a father that can speak into my life with maturity. Hello. One of, the, one of the properties of a father. Look, when my daddy spoke into my life, I, I needed somebody that had more maturity than me, more life experience than me, more understanding than me. I needed somebody that was steeped in life that could could speak into my life and bring me to a higher place and there were many times i'd call my dad and say hey dad i you know let's just talk about something and what what about this and what about that and and, and look you got to find that person in your life if you are especially if you're a five-fold leader you need somebody that can speak into your life with maturity not a brother not somebody that's on the same level as you but somebody that's more mature than you, because watch this. If you have a brother that you're calling a father and you don't have the respect and reverence for him as a father, as soon as he corrects you, you're going to get offended. And that's going to be the beginning of the end of the relationship. When you have a father, you already expect correction. The Bible says in Hebrews, look, uh, Hebrews 12, I think it is. Look, Hebrews 12 says, 
you will know an individual that is a son and you'll understand the father-son relationship one of the ways that you can do that is by correction when correction comes that son will be able to receive correction from the father if you can't receive correction from somebody that you're calling your father they're not your father that's Bible you have to be able to receive correction from a father and the Bible says uh, not cussing the Bible says uh, if you can't receive correction from your father you're a bastard you're an illegitimate child you're not a genuine son so that's one of the uh, markers if you're going to submit to somebody as a father you have to be willing to submit to correction from that person if you're not willing for anybody to correct you you you're not ready for a father yet you're not ready for a spiritual father okay um, I told you about my dad um, amen my dad was um, again not a church goer really until his later the later years of his life and I was a pastor and I'll never forget, at 50 years of age, my dad came to visit me in Columbus, Ohio. And I was ministering. He came to the, the service that Sunday. And I never heard my dad tell me he was proud of me. I mean, it was just part of the brokenness of relationship when you don't grow up with your dad. And I told you, I met him at 14. And, you know, so it took us about probably five, six, seven, eight years before we really kind of healed that breach. And then now I'm an adult man, but now I've got to submit to him as my father in certain ways. And I loved it because I never had a mature man that was my DNA that I could submit to. I wanted him to speak into my life. I enjoyed his correction because when he corrected me, it said that he loved me enough to put me back on the right path. And so I never forget my my dad were out on the, uh, the deck and you know uh, I'm not a cook but I was trying to cook some ribs and I still had the skin on it and my dad came out there and he said boy get out the way and let me show you how to cook ribs and I said okay dad and my dad took the skin off the ribs and you know prepared them and laid it out and he put it on and I in my spirit I just said thank you but in my spirit I was saying thank you God because nobody ever taught me how to cook ribs. Nobody loved me enough. And they just watched me do the ribs and they just say, oh, it's okay. Or yeah, um, mm, that's really good. And it really wasn't. But my daddy loved me enough to correct me. And he says, you don't know what you're doing. Let me show you how to do this. And my daddy showed me how to prepare ribs and how to fix ribs, how to barbecue ribs. And my heart was leaping with joy because my daddy was teaching me something. That's the nature of the true relationship of a father, natural or spiritual. When a spiritual father corrects you, your heart is glad. The Bible says reproofs of instruction are the way of life. See? But if your brother corrects you, you're going to go, man, I thought we were boys. I thought we were, you know, come on, man. I thought we were, no, 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 no. And you might get offended based upon how hard he comes at you. But when your daddy corrects you, when your spiritual father, or even, uh, this is not gender specific. There are many women that are spiritual fathers, quote unquote, quote unquote. and many women who are spiritual mothers. My wife and I function in team ministry. I'm a spiritual father. My wife is a spiritual mother. To many, she's a spiritual mother to men. Some of the men that I am a spiritual father to, my wife is a spiritual mother to them, and they need both of those. That's a whole nother subject and a whole nother time of ministry. Amen. Bless you, Monica, my baby girl. Dr. Ronnie, bless you from South Africa. And Miller, Apostle Miller Montaya, bless you, sir. Man, we've got to reconnect sometime. Uh, we've got disconnected. Uh, Bishop Chawita in Zimbabwe. Bless you, Zip Bishop. Long time no see. Um, but let me get back to my message. We've got to really heal this breach of spiritual fathering. Oh, I was on my, uh, I was talking about my dad came to my message. He came to my, my church and I was ministering. 
And uh, after I finished ministering, my dad, I call, had a call for prayer. My dad came up for prayer. I'm going to tell you, it was all I could do to keep it together. I almost lost it. The first time my dad came to me as a pastor and I'm able to lay my hands on him and pray for him, I almost lost it. But I kept it together. And my dad, I laid my hands on him. I don't even remember what we prayed about. But I prayed about it, something with him, joined, touched, and agreed. And my daddy with tears streaming down his face, he looked at me and he said, son, I'm proud of you. Wow. Every son longs for the day to hear his father say, I'm proud of you. That was the first time. Now, I've had, my uncle told me he was proud of me. I was in college and my uncle was like a surrogate father for me and and uh, he used to help me out in college. He Many times he said, uh, Eric, I'm proud of you, man. I appreciate you doing a good job, man. Keep, keep it going. But he was like a type, he was a surrogate father for me before my father and I really established our relationship properly. And I loved hearing my uncle tell me, I'm proud of you. He was a father type. He was a type of father for me. But when my Daddy, my real father, said to me, I'm proud of you. Man, it was like electricity went through my body, my soul, and everything like came alive. That's the longing that every person has for a father. You came in this world through a father, and you're always going to have a need for a father's affirmation, a father's love, a father's protection, all of these things. I, I did a message one time, did 12 or 14 things that a father provides. Can't do that today. But let me finish my scripture here and get ready to wind up this message. I told you I'd be, only be here for 30 minutes. I don't know how many, how many minutes I've been here. But um, let me tell you something. Jesus was a father but he submitted to a father it's a whole nother principle just because you're a father doesn't mean you don't need a father the Bible says that Jesus was the father of many sons the Old Testament says that one of the things they would call him would be everlasting father but Jesus submitted to his father. He said, I don't do anything unless my father tells me to do it. That's a whole nother subject, whole nother topic, whole nother teaching, uh, because we don't know how to follow, follow the footsteps of a father. Paul said, be ye imitators of me. He called Timothy his son, my son, Timothy. You know what that means? That means that Paul the Apostle Paul was Timothy's spiritual father. Like it, don't like it, pull out one scripture and say, call no man father. Look, even after that scripture, call no man father, you go over to Romans and the writer of Romans says that Abraham was the father of faith and the father of many nations. So you can't extract one scripture and use it to develop your theology. There are too many other scriptures that talk about spiritual fathers in the Bible. Hezekiah said, David was my father, my father, David. I built on his pattern because he's the seed that gave me life. He's the DNA. He's the pattern that gave me my construct for building. Hezekiah said that about David. And David was not his immediate biological father. He was his lineage. He was part of his lineage, but he was not his biological father. I think it was three or four generations removed. But Hezekiah called David his father. You've got to find your father. You've got to know how to connect with your father's voice. Again, you recognize your father's voice. When your father speaks, 
there's something that resonates in you that says, I think I'm hearing my father. And the Bible says that he, uh, he calls his sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him. A father goes before you. A father goes before you. He goes ahead of you. You can't have a father that's walking in lockstep with you but has never gone before you. You can't take me somewhere that you've never been. Hello? And I'm ta not talking about every single step that you make. I'm saying this is where that whole element of maturity comes from. You can't take somebody somewhere that you've never been. So you can't be 32 years old and your spiritual father is 32 and he, and I'm not saying that you can't have a spiritual father at 32. Right? Don't, don't get that wrong. Because there are some 32-year-olds who have been down the road for the last 15 years and they can father you at 32, but they have more experience, more training, more um more uh, familiarity with the journey than you do because they've been on the path longer than you. So I'm not saying that a 32-year-old, it's rare, but I'm not saying that a 32-year-old cannot be a spiritual father. They can, okay? And a 32-year-old can father a 19-year-old. No problem. But you don't just take on the mantle of a father just because you've been around a long time because that... You know, fathering has a whole, that's a whole dimension to fathering, okay? I, I just mentioned a few of those. You got to have the element of affection, protection, direction, provision. Um, there are many things that go into fathering, and not everybody has a father's heart. Some people don't want to be a father. I, I've heard pastors say, man, I, this guy come to me and ask me to be his father. I don't want to be anybody, nobody's father. Then you don't have a father's heart. I'm a different person. I, 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 I'll try to father anybody that comes along. I have to, my wife has to speak into my life and say, uh, honey, are you sure that's your son? <laughs> okay, because I, I have such a passion to help and to minister and to be a father because I recognize that I didn't have a father and I've never wanted, whenever I see somebody without a father, my heart goes out to them. So I made some mistakes in connecting with people that are as sons, and they really weren't sons. And they proved that later, but I had to find it out the hard way. So that's a whole nother message. Uh, everybody that connects with you is not necessarily your son. And, and some, sometimes, uh, uh, let me just share this. There's a difference between a mentor and a son. That's why Paul said, uh, 1 Corinthians 4.15 uh, you may have 10,000 instruction instructors, but not many fathers. There are a whole lot of people. You can go out on the Internet and find a thousand teachings in a week. And those people are instructors, but they may not be your father. There are many instructors, but there are only a few genuine fathers. Let's say that. Um, and you can have several fathers in a lifetime. Let me mention that. One of my spiritual fathers passed away when I was in my 30s. And so I realized that I still needed a spiritual father. And so it took me a few years to go and find another spiritual father because I needed that maturity. I needed somebody to speak into my life. I needed somebody to help direct my steps. I needed somebody to correct me when I was wrong. And I had enough respect for them that they could correct me, and it was okay. Okay? So I needed that. But, uh, again, everybody is not a spiritual father. Some people are mentors, and they're not fathers. you got to understand what a mentor is. A mentor is different from a father. A mentor, uh, you can get mentored in a lot of different ways, a lot of different things. You know, the guy who's giving me golf lessons, he's a mentor. He's mentoring me in the game of golf. He's not my father. He's a mentor. The guy that teaches you how to play chess is a mentor. He mentors you in chess. The, the, the person who took me under wing when I was working in the secular field and um, uh, there was a woman that took me under wing 
a, a couple women actually uh, that that I can recall them immediately right now because they mentored me in the marketplace. They saw something of value in me and they mentored me. They weren't my father. They were a mentor. A mentor supplies something in a specific area and of expertise that they have, but then they may not touch your life in, in all these other categories, okay? Please understand there's a difference between a mentor in the spirit realm even. You may find somebody that can be a mentor to you in the prophetic, but they're not your spiritual father, okay? I've learned from a lot of different people in the prophetic. Uh, one of the first people that I really sat under their teaching in order to learn the prophetic was Graham Cook years ago. I bought everything that I could get my hands on. I bought all of his tapes, all of his messages, all of his CDs, uh, his books. I read them cover to cover. I gave them to those that were under my leadership. Graham Cook, he was a mentor in the prophetic, but he wasn't my father. I had to realize he's not my father. A father, a mentor, will train you up in specific areas of expertise, but a father is not there for you for a specific, uh, one specific area or expertise to mentor you. A father is there to help you do life. Put that in your notes if you're taking them. A father is with you for life not for a specific assignment, not to teach you or train you in a particular thing. That's a teacher. That's a mentor. That's somebody that can train you in the prophetic. That's somebody that can train you in deliverance. As somebody can, just because somebody trains you in deliverance doesn't make them your father. Your father may not even have a grace in, the, uh, in that area of deliverance, but your father has your DNA and he has your spirit and he your, his spirit and your spirit are in lockstep they resonate together and again you have the reverence and honor of, for him that he can speak into your life he can help shape you and mold you and develop you and then you have to determine who that is and so let me get ready to wrap this up this three section uh, three verse section of scripture here um, and and so the Bible says hey Malia and uh, Apostle Charles and Tracy, bless you, Tracy. Uh, Michael, uh, young Michael, amen. Bless you, Michael, and Youngstown. Appreciate you, man. Say hello to your dad, Apostle Scott. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Jeff Sims, can you have more than one spiritual father? Uh, it's, it's, it's not proper or appropriate to have more than one spiritual father living. Do you hear what I said? So in other words, I had a spiritual father who died when I was a young, you know, relatively young Christian. And after he died, I began to look for somebody else. But I've never had three spiritual fathers at one time. Ne neither have I had three biological fathers at one time, nor three surrogate fathers, really, you don't have multiple fathers. Generally speaking, people who have multiple fathers haven't figured out who their father is. I hope that answers your question, Jeff. People who have multiple fathers are still trying to figure out who their father is. Because some of these people are not your fathers, they're just mentors. Okay? Miles Monroe was a mentor for me. He was a mentor in kingdom. He was a mentor uh, in purpose. Those two messages, purpose, kingdom. Miles Monroe was a mentor for me. And, and I'm not just saying it because he was, you know, way out here a mentor. He was even, you know, I, I went to his conferences and sat under him. I had Miles Monroe in my church and he ministered on one of those topics. I, I think it was kingdom. In purpose, his mix, his message, you know, was folded. But Miles was never my spiritual father. But he was a mentor. And I recognized who he was in my life. He was a mentor. 
And I'm not one of these people that, you know, say, oh, Miles, you know, yeah, I know Miles. He, Dr. Miles, God rest his soul, he, he, he was one of my, he was my, my main man. No, he was not my main man. He, I had very great honor and reverence for him. I would not even refer to him that way. I referred to him as Dr. Miles. He was a mentor. And I honored and respected him for that. And when he came with that word, I submitted to that word. But we never developed a relationship of a father. I couldn't call him up on the phone. If he saw me in the airport, he knew me, he recognized me, we'd speak, that kind of thing. He did my wife and I, our 25th wedding anniversary, Dr. Miles Monroe did that ceremony for our 25th wedding anniversary, along with A.R. Bernard. He was, we did it on a cruise. They did a, we, that was our 25th anniversary. They, they did the ceremony. Dr. Miles did it, gave us a certificate, the whole bit, renewal of our vows. I didn't go out and say, well, Miles Moreau's my spiritual father because he renewed my vows, our vows. No, it's not the way you select a spiritual father because somebody you sat under their ministry and, well, they came to your church. That's not, that's not your spiritual father. Dr. Miles was not my spiritual father. He was a mentor for me, even though I knew him. But he was not my father, and I knew he was not my father. It was just that, you know, that every, all the things didn't synchronize. They didn't all come together. And, you know, it's, why? Well, it's not important. So, no, you can't have multiple fathers, and you should not have multiple, no, multiple fathers. You should find out who your father is. If you're still in the process, don't call three people, four people, five people your father. Or call four people daddy. Or Come on. Come on. Get, get clear. Get focused. Get healed. And figure out who your spiritual father is. And once you do that, you'll grow a lot faster, you'll mature a lot faster, and you'll be healed. You won't have to be continuing to look for a spiritual father because once you find your father, there's a connection there that is enduring. Now, will the relationship have some ups and downs and hills and valleys? Sure. When somebody corrects you, that's not pleasant. That's not something you just say, hey, honey, I just got off the phone with dad, and man, he read me up the wall and down the other side. You know, no, you go lick your chops, you go pray, and you go say, oh, okay, was, it, was he right? Did, did he tell the truth? And then you get yourself together and say, yeah, he was right. It didn't hurt. I mean, it didn't feel good, but, you know, the Bible says correction for that moment, it's, it hurts. So you don't make a decision on the spiritual father as whether he offended you or not, okay? He will offend you if he's walking in truth. There's going to be some things he's going to have to correct you on, okay? So, um, wow, I'm probably way beyond my time, but I hope this is valuable for you, and I hope it's beneficial for you. Take this, and please disseminate this message. Please get this out. Wow. Man, I got questions on here. Uh, bless you, Belinda. Um, uh, uh, oh, Apostle, um, um, Apostle Peter's mom. Praise God. Andre, bless you, sir, Pastor Andre. Most people believe uh, their pastor is their spiritual father. Does your pastor determine who is your spiritual father? Uh, just briefly, sometimes... Your pastor is your spiritual father. Okay? I'm being very careful with my words here. Sometimes your pastor is not your spiritual father. I know people in, I'll just say a mega church. Over the years, they have come to me for fathering. Even though they weren't members of my church. But when they needed the touch of a father, they came to me. When they needed advice and counsel and love and direction, they came to me. Because they said to me, I don't know him. I'm in his church. He's my pastor. But he's not my father. And that's sad. Unfortunately, we've developed that kind of a system. And, you know, I've, I've had people say, 
that's my pastor, but uh, and I listen to his messages, but I don't know him. I go there because I can get out. It's at eight o'clock service. I can get out, get my my stuff over, and go about my business. Okay, most of those people aren't looking for a spiritual father, but um, many pastors have been and are spiritual fathers. You might look if you uh, let me just throw this out there. If you live in Columbus, Ohio, or Charlotte, North Carolina, where I am now, and you move to Florida, and you start going to somebody else's church in Florida, you've got a new pastor. Praise God. Go there. That's your pastor. Submit to that person as your pastor. That pastor may not be your father. That pastor may not be a spiritual father. I've told you many, many times pastors say, I don't want to be a father. All I want to do is pastor this church and do, do the messages and feed the community and so forth. I'm not a spiritual father. I don't want to be a spiritual father. If somebody tells you they don't want to be a spiritual father, they're probably not a spiritual father. But again, if you go to Florida and I'm your spiritual father, when you're in Florida, I can still be your spiritual father. Because again, a spiritual father is a connection for life. Now there are a lot of times that you are connected with a spiritual father and you leave. That's the prodigal son. I've got many prodigal sons out there. I'm their father. They know I'm their father. They've said I'm their father. They've called me father. But they got mad and left. Or they got offended about something and they left. Many of them are still trying to connect to a father. But you had a father. But you were too immature to understand the relationship between a father and a son like the prodigal son and the Bible says he left and he finally thank God before he died he came to himself the Bible says a prodigal son has to come to himself you can't go chasing after running after a prodigal son until they come to themselves because until they come to themselves, that means that they finally recognize who their father really was and go back and submit to their father again. And the Bible says that's why the father rejoiced, even though he had a son at home. But when the prodigal came back, he said, let's make a party. Let's have a party and bring and welcome this guy back. Don't get jealous. Just realize that he's been a, in a place of hurting. He's been eating corn husk. Because he was separated from his father. Whenever you have a father and you intentionally separate from them for whatever reason, and God put that person in your life as a father, you will continue to suffer until you make that right. Woo! Didn't intend on getting into all of that. My goodness. Wow. Okay, let me finish this scripture and let you go. And when he putteth forth his sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. You know, here's another thing. A lot of people don't know who their father is or is supposed to be because they don't know who they are. Let that sink in for a minute. You gotta know who you are. Okay? You gotta know who what's resonating inside of you. Okay, look. I was raised in Pentecostal church and a Baptist church, but I, when I really came and gave my life to the Lord, submitted my life to the Lord, um, and really started walking with him, I recognized that my DNA was not in the Baptist church and it was not in the Pentecostal church. I had to find somebody who was walking with the same DNA as me, as what I knew the Holy Spirit was working in me. Okay, I eventually ultimately found it in the apostolic prophetic flow. But at that time, that wasn't available. So I did a journey through word of faith message. And, you know, all believing equals receiving, all that stuff. You know, what you believe and, you know, faith was the dominant thing and th dominant message. Did a journey through that. As I was working out, who I was and who I was supposed to be connected with. I finally found, and it was a, it was a journey 
and and it, it's it's you know sometimes it's just a small window there, but I finally found out who I'm supposed to be connected to, and that's a journey that everybody has to go go through. So, uh, but you have to. Many people don't know who they are, so they don't know who they're supposed to be connected to. Understand what God has put in you, what God has made you, how he's crafted you, formed and developed you. And then you'll find out whose voice you're supposed to be responding to. Okay? So, um, they know his voice, and a stranger they will not follow. Woe be, woe be unto you if you end up following a stranger's voice, because that's a whole lot of wasted time. I've seen this before. I'm telling you, and I, I, you know, for brief periods, I would even, oh, oh man, that guy has a good word. Let me go to his conference. Let me get his, do this and that. And then you find out he's a stranger. Man, this guy is not really who I am. Uh, let me just throw this out here. One of the, one, a dominant theme in my life is character and integrity. Okay? That's a dominant theme in my life. That's why I wrote the book, Character, The Path That God Walks. It's been a dominant theme in my life for many, many, many years, maybe since I was a kid. So I can't connect with somebody who doesn't have good character. I just can't. I cannot follow somebody. Anybody whose character is flawed, if you, you may be a spiritual father, but if you have a very flawed character, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not talking about that anybody that never makes a mistake. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, look, I've been married for 48 years, 49 years, okay, 48 years. I don't cheat on my wife. I don't have a girlfriend on the side. I don't do that. Unfortunately, I've known pastors that do, I've known bishops that do, I've known fathers that do. I can't follow anybody like that. That's a strange voice for me. You can have all the gifting, you can have an oratorical skills, you can know the Bible backwards and forwards, but if you are someone who does not walk in with integrity in your marriage and in your family, I can't walk with you. I can't hear that sound. I can't walk with that sound. I can't respond to that sound. That's not part of my identity. That's not part of my DNA. We're not supposed to walk together because whatever sons you have will embrace you and follow you and walk with you despite the fact that maybe, or maybe because their character is the same, I don't know. But I need, God knows what I need. I need somebody that I can respect that I can honor. And I can't respect you if you speak one thing in the pulpit and you do something else at home. I can't respect that. That's just the way God made me. Or maybe he didn't make you that way. That's fine. You work that out with God. I'm not saying that my, uh, my value system is yours. I think it's godly, but maybe you don't. That's okay. You have to figure that out. But my value system and the way God made me and the way God constructed me is that in order for me to be really submitted to a spiritual father, I have to have certain things that we are in alignment and in harmony with. And uh, I, I found out one time somebody that I was a spiritual father of mine, I found out that they were in fact not faithful to their wife on a consistent basis. I'm not saying that they had a moral failure. I'm saying it was a hat, it was a practice. And when I found that out, I'm gone. See ya. Can't do that. Especially when you're corrected and you don't correct the behavior. Can't do that. No, that's not me. That's not my DNA. And obviously you're not my father. You were just a mentor. Okay? Because uh a father, you have to be able to receive impartation from a father, okay? And, and, and again, I, I'm not talking about perfection. People make, make mistakes, and I, you know, God forbid if everybody held my mistakes against me. But there are certain things that for me are non-negotiable, okay? That's all I'm saying. And, and that may not be your, your particular 
uh, issue, but that's mine, okay? Um, please forgive me for going down these rabbit trails, but, you know, there's so much in me about this subject that when I get to talking about it, I end up going down rabbit trails just because that's how I get led. Amen. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit's leading, maybe it's Apostle Warren. <laughs> but um, these are some of these are rabbit trails, but hopefully you get something from that rabbit trail and you can extract from it and it becomes something that, that will uh, help you to walk in, in, in your life uh, and your journey with the, with the Lord. So, um, another, a stranger he will not follow, but he'll flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Okay? You got to know the voice of a father, and that father's voice has to resonate with you, or has to resonate with you. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they they were, which he spake unto them. So here we are. I go back to where I began. Um, it's a parable. It's a very significant parable. It's a very powerful parable of learning how to connect with the sound of a father's voice. And the Bible says if they're a stranger, he'll flee from them. Look. If what you see in me and what you hear in me resonates with you and is consistent with what God is birthed in you and what God is birthing in you, I may be your spiritual father or I may not. But you have to turn and you have to hear that voice, listen to that voice, and then the father has to turn and recognize and acknowledge you, okay? And when there's a synergy in that turning of a son to a father's voice, and there's a response of that father to the turning of the son, you've got the beginnings, the beginnings of what may be a spiritual father-son process. You've got the beginnings. And I want to tell you that the Bible says in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, that the creation, well, Romans says the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. I'm, I'm just using this language metaphorically. But Malachi 4 says that when sons, children, is the word sons. When sons turn to fathers and fathers turn to sons, there's healing. And until that happens, there's a curse. And what we're seeing throughout the earth right now, in the church, in biological families, is a curse is the manifestation of a curse because fathers and sons are not connected. There are many young men and women running through the streets of our neighborhoods and our cities and our communities that just don't have a father and they need to connect to one. They just don't have a father. I want you to understand that this is a season where you need to find your father, connect to him. I've done it. I've, I've been the journey. And look, I'm 70 years old. I've been through spiritual fathers and had spiritual fathers pass away. But I'm still always open to getting into the company and the environment of spiritual fathers. I learn things, even if it's not my spiritual father, I still learn things being in the company of fathers. That's a whole nother subject. You learn things being in the company of fathers. And so, um, Lisa, 
Uh, you started this. Amen. You started this. Hey, Apostle Dana, good to see you, man. Appreciate you. You're doing a great work, Apostle Dana in Arizona. Um, look, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta heal what's going on in the body of Christ. We gotta heal what's going on in families. Uh, I know what it's like not to have a father and to have my heart hurting and to be angry. I used to carry a gun in college. I used to go for bad. I used to carry a pistol because I was angry and I needed a father and I didn't have one. I wasn't connected like I needed to be. Whenever you're disconnected from your father, you do crazy things. You do bad things. You're crying out for attention. You're crying out for to be heard or you're walking out of your pain. We got a lot of biological children that are in pain and crying out for a father and a mother. We've got a lot of spiritual children that are in pain and crying out for a spiritual father and mother. They're doing things that are completely off the grid, outside of the realm of how they should be walking, but it's because they don't have a father to guide them, direct them, protect them, and help them. Don't be one of those. Find your father. It may not be me. I'm not saying I'm not everybody's father. But there's somebody that you should be trying to connect with as a spiritual father if you don't have one. Okay? Uh, I want to leave uh, my information. My wife just told me to leave my information um, with you before I sign off. I'm not very good at that kind of thing, but I need to get better. Okay? Um, my website is ericwarnministries.com. Um, I don't have a lot out there. I just rebuilt my website, and I'm trying to really repack it, re you know, put rebuild it basically, not just rebuild it physically and structurally, but put stuff in there. And uh, my uh, YouTube page. I'm trying to do a new YouTube page right now. Uh, this is a, a a new season in my life, so I'm doing new things. Okay, if that makes sense. So I am uh, really um, uh, pulling together some new resources. Uh, I'm going to start doing some webinars uh, here very shortly. I've been going through the different formats. I'll probably end up with uh, Demio. Uh, just had a conversation with them this week. Um, so I can start doing webinar series. And um, I thought I was going to do online classes, but I may just stick with webinar series. And so just going through all of that and trying to figure out how you get your information out there and, and, and the word out there. And because here's the reality, there are people that may need to connect with my voice, but until they hear my voice, they won't know that they can connect with me. That's the reality. And so part of my responsibility is, is to make sure that my voice is heard so that those who may be looking for me will be able to find me and connect with me. So that's my purpose for giving this information. Um, again, I'm Apostle Eric Warren. My um, uh, website is ericwarnministries.com. 